Chapter 14 Mission 22, We'd Be Happy With Any Data At All, Really, Part 2 of 6 Outside, two miles west of her, tens of thousands of beings ponies, changelings, dragons, griffins, minotaurs and other creatures had gathered in the heat of a Oriden summer afternoon to watch her launch. Outside technicians topped off her fuel tanks, performed the final checks on her ship the fully charged batteries, the gimbals of the various engines, the landing gear of the landing stage, the scientific equipment, and the probot Abedine core which could, in an emergency, take over for her. Outside reporters scribbled down quotes for newspapers, television faces blathered about the painfully obvious, and photographers used up enough film to make a couple of Applewood movies. But inside the little capsule at the top of the enormous stack it was just cherry, with a couple of tiny windows, a control panel full of switches and buttons and readouts, and Chrysalis's voice in her earphones. She could hear the fans of her spacesuit as they cycled air in and out. She could feel the faint creaking of the ship, which reminded her with every little flutter of wind that the success or failure of her mission depended on whether or not a lot of changelings kept their minds on their welding and riveting despite all the many distractions changelings, 388, were subject to. The launch window for Minmus opened at sunset meaning that launching earlier in the day would force Cherry to wait in orbit while Minmus trundled around Equus until her rocket and the little false star were lined up for the planned course. There was some fudge factor afterwards, but launching as soon as the window opened gave you more time to fix problems if and when they cropped up. The days when CSP could just say go and launch a rocket were ending, and the days of precision launch timing and orderly countdowns had arrived to take their place. Cherry wasn't sure what she thought of that. On the one hoof, anything that increased her chances of still eating cherries when she was older than Granny Smith had her approval. But on the other hoof, part of the freedom of flying was the idea that you were free to fly whenever you wanted, to just take off and go. She'd miss that, at least where it came to rockets. The final two minutes of the countdown began, and Cherry got to work performing the final tests. She responded to each of Chrysalis's call-outs for tests and readings. She heard Fiddlewings get clear shriek at the one-minute mark, as the ground crew cleared out from the pad at top speed. She heard the pumps for the first stage engines, far below her, start up, churning, pressurizing the fuel lines and final preparation for launch. She set the throttle to 92%. At that setting, held steady the liquid rockets would burn out at the same time as the four solid fuel boosters. She activated SAS, shifted in her flight couch the tiny bit her straps would allow, and listened as the count trailed down from 10 to 5 and then to 1. Her hoof struck the staging button exactly on zero. In the first days of the program, a launch combined the heavy pressure of Faust's own hoof combined with the vibration of a shake mixer. The vibration had remained but not the absurd acceleration forces. Cherry felt only twice as heavy as normal as Mission 22's altimeter began ticking up, as the engines struggled to lift the enormous mass of the spaceship into the air. This left her more than able to appreciate the ungodly noise of the engines behind her, only partially muffled by the same headphones that allowed Chrysalis at the Capcom station to talk to her. She reported her actions tipping down 15 degrees from vertical, aiming just above the due east line on the nav ball, at 10 seconds into flight. The ship responded smoothly despite the vibrations of the rockets, fully under her control, just as in every simulation. Of course, she thought to herself, the fun stuff begins with the second stage, doesn't it? By 30 seconds into the flight she was already flying faster than the speed of sound. The ship rammed its way through air that didn't want to move aside, the resistance rising with the square of velocity or was it the cube? Cherry could never remember until, at a certain point, the ship would meet that magical point known as Max Q, where atmospheric density and velocity combined to exert the most stress the ship would ever encounter in the entire mission. And by chance, or lax planning, or the simple hodgepodge design of Mission 22, Max Q came almost exactly at the moment Stage 1 burned out. There had been options, of course, the bugs had finally been worked out of the next, larger generation of rocket engines, which were now in full production in Apollo Aza. 
Mission 22 could have been flown with a single stack of engines and tanks instead of the bundle of explosive sticks Cherry was guiding into the skies. But that would have been an untested design, and Mission R4 had proven this design viable, with a few tweaks. Better to use a known and tested design than to risk the mission than to risk Cherry's life on a new one. At 97 seconds into flight, right on time, the first stage burned out, liquid and solid fuel systems alike. Cherry held the ship's nose steady, directly into the prograde circle on the nav ball, and hit the staging button within half a second of burnout. The stage decouplers fired, and simultaneously the second stage engines lit, pushing the ship through max Q and away from the disintegrating first stage, whose components tumbled, collided, and exploded well away from the still rising ship. Cautiously very, very cautiously Cherry began pushing down the ball again towards a more horizontal course. She still owed Dragonfly an apology, the second stage of this design wanted to tumble and spiral out of the sky at low altitude, no matter who was at the stick. It took a skilled pilot to make this design work, and after hundreds of hours in the simulator, and especially now as she felt the ship through her hooves, she'd realized Dragonfly was a pretty darn skilled pilot, after all. Even now, even with design tweaks to better balance the ship and keep it from constantly tipping northwards during flight, the ship still wiggled in flight. Part of that was due to the ship being underpowered early in its flight, 30 seconds after staging the ship pulled only 1.5 g of acceleration, though that was rising quickly as the ship burned through the fuel in its outer stacks. Without the same firm push of the first stage, the ship's nose seemed to want to go north, south, up down any place except where Cherry wanted it to go. The SAS system kept things manageable, but Cherry didn't want to think about what it would be like to try to fly the ship up without the stability assist. And yet, despite her best efforts, the ship's twitches added up to a gradual southern drift. The mission profile called for a trajectory a bit north of due east, to match Minmus's orbital plane. She pushed the ship's nose northward, well above the target, to correct relaxing slightly as the ship's wiggling diminished with the thinning air outside. 22, or Eden, stand by for Seco. Crud. That was too soon. Seco's second stage engine cut off at this point meant the ship's apoapsis was at or near the target altitude for parking orbit, on a steeper than planned trajectory. Her course was still too southerly. That meant a fuel-expensive double correction on the orbital insertion burn eating into the fuel safety margin. Granted, there ought to be plenty of fuel and to spare for the mission, but... Seco. Cherry shut down the throttle and called back, engine shut down, we have Seco. Seco confirmed, 22. Current apoapsis projected in 2 minutes 37 seconds. Orbital insertion in 2 minutes mark. 22 copies, or Eden. Mission 22 coasted upwards through the wispy upper atmosphere, bound for space. Its sole occupant relaxed, considering the situation. There had been a goof up, and it was minor. There was more than enough Delta V in the mission budget to correct it. The worst part of the flight was over, and the obligatory buck up was behind her. It looked like it would be a good flight. Footnote 388 And to be fair, ponies too. But particularly changelings. End footnote. Chrysalis pretended not to see the denizens of the bullpen going quietly nuts. Cherry Berry Miss Perfect Pilot, Miss Can't Miss, Miss Steel-Eyed Missile Mare had screwed up. As they watched and waited, she was in the process of badly overcorrecting her trajectory, tilting the final orbit well above what was desired for a shot at Minmus. It wasn't a disaster just something that required the Minotaur eggheads to completely recalculate the burns for Minmus insertion now that the old plans were totally useless. They'd asked her to tell the pony to stop the burn and readjust. Chrysalis had refused. She'd learned to tell the difference between the pony pretending to be calm and the pony actually relaxed. Right now she was in her happy place, and considering she'd be up in space for two weeks to come, Chrysalis wanted her kept in her happy place. If that meant burning a little unnecessary fuel, fine by her. Occupant had had the good sense not to try to override her. 
she'd let him be in charge just as long as he did what she wanted him to do, and he knew it. Finally, she heard the pony's squeaky voice, shut down. Or Ethan, we have orbit, repeat we have orbit. Chrysalis double-checked the projection on the wall. Orbit confirmed, 22, she drawled. Good work. And, indeed, it was a very good orbit even Chrysalis had to admit it. Apoapsis and periapsis were within a kilometer of one another an almost perfectly circular orbit. The fact that it was 11 degrees more inclined than it ought to have been was, to be frank, a minor detail. But now it was time to deliver the bad news wrapped in as much sugar as she could manage, and a changeling queen knew how to ladle on the sugar when desired. Unfortunately I'm afraid you've overshot the target orbital inclination a bit, she continued. But trajectory tells me that actually works out to our advantage, since it makes a polar orbital insertion over Minmus much easier. She noticed George Bull's head pop up from the huddle, staring at her with betrayal written all over his face. She switched off her microphone long enough to say, make it work, before switching it back on and continuing, we'll have two burns calculated for you in a couple of minutes. Stand by, 22. Copy, or Ethan. 22 standing by. Chrysalis switched the mic off again and said, all right, geniuses. Make it happen. Do you realize you're asking us to rewrite the laws of motion and physics itself for your convenience? George Bull asked. Just so Miss Barry won't feel bad. That's exactly what I'm asking, Chrysalis replied coolly. You get paid the big bucks to work miracles. Well, now it's miracle time. Get cracking. Well, Von Braun rumbled from his station. We'd have to go on this orbit. No parking orbit for final testing, but bringing down the orbital inclination will also get us extra velocity, we'll have to use the same delta V for the transminimus injection, but... Dr. Bull, come here and check my calculations. The other minotaurs George Bull, George Cowley and Mark Knee gathered around their leader. It looks correct, George Bull said cautiously. I shall test it immediately. Mark Knee said jotting down some numbers and then rushing back to his trajectory calculation computer. Well. Chrysalis asked. If this checks out, Von Braun said, the new intercept for Minmus will take a faster trajectory. We'll have to burn a bit more juice to slow down, but it looks like we'll shave a whole day or more off the outbound leg. It eats most of the Delta V we saved from not having a satellite on board this trip, George Bull grumbled. The second landing is looking a bit iffy after this. We'll have to see how the orbital insertion burn goes. If we have the fuel to do it, let's do it, Chrysalis insisted. One day less in space is one day sooner she comes home, right? And, she thought to herself, one day sooner we drop this stupid side issue and focus on the real job. One day closer to my hooves touching the moon. Um, yeah, occupant said quietly. Sounds good to me, too. How soon can we have the burn procedure? The first burn is straightforward, Von Braun said. We can send her that now. The second burn, we have 28 minutes before that, and we want to use all of that double-checking it. Fine-tuning, too, George Bull said. The closer the ship comes to Minmus the better. Less fuel used in lowering the orbit. Okay, occupants said. My queen. Yes, yes, I know, Chrysalis said testily. Von Braun, give me that burn info. Asterisk. The sun came up over the rim of Equus. By now or Eden, below and behind her, laid in darkness, the princesses of sun and moon having done their jobs to keep Equus's orbital system semi-stable. Below and ahead of her laid the Philippine island chain and above Cherry Berry laid the rest of creation, and in a few short minutes she would be headed for it. Okay, 22, we've confirmed a good correction burn, Chrysalis said. We're feeding your nav ball the target now for the transminimus insertion burn. This one will require a burn to burn out of the central second stage, which should take 2 minutes 13 seconds, followed by a full burn of the landing stage for 31 seconds. 
Burn to empty on second stage, 31 seconds on landing stage, Cherry repeated. She punched keys on the number pad, entering the times into the ship's computer. 389. After that we'll burn at minimum throttle to adjust trajectory to bring you as close to Minmus as possible, Chrysalis continued. That'll mostly be due anti-normal, with a couple of anti-radial bursts to keep the trajectory from drifting too far left or right. Roger that, or Ethan, Cherry said. How long until TMI? Chrysalis's voice muttered softly over the connection, something about a year and a half ago. Say again, or Ethan. I didn't copy that, Cherry said. Transminmus injection burn in 6 minutes 30 seconds mark, Chrysalis said, a bit more clearly. Roger, or Ethan, Cherry said. She looked back out the window, as the ship passed over the Terminator and the surface of Equus lit up in its blues and greens and browns and whites below her. Six minutes, she thought, until I kiss that goodbye. Twenty-two, or Ethan. Chrysalis's voice said again after a moment. Go ahead, or Ethan, Cherry replied. What's it like up there? We still have a lot of people watching down here who'd like to hear about it. Cherry forced herself to smile. Her face, she knew, was being projected on the wall of mission control and on a series of giant screens around or Eden Space Center for those who came out to view the launch. They'd all know at once if she showed exactly how much she didn't want to do public relations babbling with an important burn minutes away. Well, it's space, she said, frantically thinking of anything to say anything safe, that was. It feels like I'm flying under my own power, floating without a care. Her smile became a little more genuine as she added, makes me feel hungry. You can have supper after the burn, Chrysalis said. How's the ship performing? Pretty good, with the lower stages mostly gone, Cherry replied, not thinking any more about putting on a show for the people below. It'll probably fly beautifully once I ditch the second stage. At least, I'm counting on it. After a pause, Chrysalis asked, did you bring a good book? You're going to be up there for a while, you know. Actually, I left some good books with you, Cherry said. If I brought books up, they'd take up space and cost me Delta V. But if you read to me, I can enjoy the books without having them up here, right? This time the pause before Chrysalis spoke became very significant. I believe you forgot to brief us on that one, 22, the changeling queen at Capcom said in a quiet voice. Oops, Cherry said. Well, I'm sure you can find some pony to do it. Get Timble. He's got a good voice. And it's not like he can keep saying, this is mission control or Eden for 15 days. I can too. Timble's voice, full of pout, echoed over the comms channel. We'll take it under advisement, 22, Chrysalis said. Two minutes to TMI burn. Copy, or Eden. There. PR over, back to work. Cherry checked the target marker lit up in dark blue on the light blue navball, and carefully steered the ship on its reaction wheels until it appeared in the center of the ball. Standing by for ignition call, she said. 90 seconds, Chrysalis said, and then, 60 seconds, and then, 30 seconds. At 15 seconds she began counting down, and when the queen said, ignition, Cherry's hoof was already on the throttle. The sole remaining engine of the second stage, the other two having been dumped during orbital insertion when their tanks ran dry, came to life, and Cherry felt the rocket push against her back like the gentle guiding hoof of Faust. This is it, she thought. I'm really on my way. Fifteen days of flying in space. Most of it just flying, with nothing to do. If it wasn't so dangerous, I'd call this the best vacation ever. The rocket burned on and on and on steadily accelerating the much-reduced ship until, with a sputter, it died, out of fuel. One more explosive collar fired, and with a push of a button the two descent engines came to life, pushing the ship even faster towards the blackness of space. Equus slipped out of view of the little window above Cherry's head, leaving only the sun and the stars. And then, 
at precisely 31 seconds, Cherry shut down the engine. Shut down, she reported. Good burn, 22, Chrysalis reported. We currently show you flying more or less over Minmus's North Pole at an altitude of 1,000 kilometers a little more than five days from now. A few more tiny bursts of fuel brought that down from 1,000 kilometers to a mere 100 kilometers. Then Cherry Berry deployed the landing gear, turned the ship so that a solar panel faced the sun directly, and relaxed. Minmus or bust, she thought. Footnote 389 since the burn would be manual, the computer would have nothing to do with it beyond displaying a countdown clock to engine shutdown. Cherry only used the keypad because she still had her spacesuit helmet on, which meant she couldn't grip a pencil in her teeth to write anything down. End footnote. On thousands of television screens across E. Kestria, the faces of mature-looking stallions and mares solemnly looked out at the viewers and read the news. Each of them had a short news item about Mission 22, so interchangeable that they might as well have read from the same script. The version watched in the Astromare Recreation Room at Or Eden Space Center went something like this. All systems are go for astronaut Cherry Berry as Changeling Space Program Mission 22 continues speeding on its way towards the mysterious star known as Minmus. Mission planners expect a round trip of between 15 and 18 days during which Cherry will spend virtually all her time in a space barely larger than the lower bunk of a foal's bunk beds. With the orbital insertion burn four days away, Cherry has nothing to do except watch and wait. Leading equestrian psychologists expressed concern that such monotonous conditions in such a cramped space could drive ponies mad. We shall watch and wait to see what happens. Chrysalis, remembering that television report, snorted into her microphone. She wasn't worried about the pony going nuts. She was worried about going nuts herself. There were four astronauts taking turns in six-hour shifts at the Capcom station herself on the evening shift from six until midnight, Gordon the Griffin from midnight to six, Dragonfly from six to noon, and Fireball the Dragon from noon to six. And yet, for whatever reason, Cherry Berry insisted that Chrysalis be the one to read from the book of the day. St. Ralton was one of the many small towns that dotted the northeastern plains of E. Kestria. It had a drugstore and a movie theater and a school, all of which were mentioned proudly on the sign next to the road that led into town. It also had a cheap clover, whose name was not on the sign, but he didn't mind that. And for whatever reason, the pony had chosen what looked like a filly's library of 50-year-old tripe, 390. Somehow Chrysalis got through the sickly sweet story, 391. And the one after that before Cherry Berry declared a meal break. This food pack says Market Garden Salad Vinaigrette. There isn't a water nozzle on it, so I guess I eat it as is. Bon appétit, 22, Chrysalis said, only partly successful at concealing her absolute disinterest. The sounds of a food pack rustling echoed in the Queen's ears as, on the mission control screen, Cherry Berry stuffed her face into the pack. After a number of pleased sounds, she removed the pack to say, Wow, this is good. A great mix of sweet and sour. Sweet cherries, sour shallots, lettuce and spinach, walnuts and blue cheese. It's really good. She returned to her meal, pausing only a moment to add, a bit heavy on the vinegar, though. 392 I'll pass that along, Chrysalis lied. Asterisk. And the masked Matterhorn, the actual and genuine masked Matterhorn, actually said, Ouch. Ha 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 ha. Cherry Berry giggled on the other end of the telepresence spell. Who wouldn't say ouch if they were dumped onto a barbed wire fence? Oh, I could make a list, Chrysalis grumbled. Feeling hungry yet, or do I need to finish the story? Finish the story. Cherry Berry said. It's nearly done anyway, right? Thankfully it was, with only two pages to go, without even a friendly skunk to relieve the sickly sweetness of it all. Okay, lunch time. Cherry declared. Lunch. Chrysalis asked. Isn't it dinner? The sun's down here, remember? I know. 
but remember what the bulls said? My orbital insertion burn will be more or less right as the mission clock begins day 6, right? So I'm trying to reset my sleep cycle so I get up about an hour or two before sunset your time, so I'll have the full day to work with, alert and ready. Lucky you, 22. Chrysalis had to deal with the press and officials, plus the occasional hive emergency, during daylight hours. She was beginning to feel the effects of losing a couple hours of sleep each night. So, since you'll tell me even if I don't ask, what's the meal of the day? Ooh. It's Kieran cooking. I didn't know heavy frosting new Kieran recipes. Tofu and noodles with edamame and cherries. I'll just add water and let this warm up. Note to myself, Chrysalis thought. Find out when Carapace ever met a Kieran that talked, never mind a Kieran chef. I know I declared the Kieran off limits, 393. Asterisk. The rain came down on the roof of the old cattle car, but none of it came inside. The fillies gathered around one another, dry and safe, listening to the tapping of the raindrops on the old wood above. I have an idea said Sassafras. We don't have to run any farther than this. We can live right here, in this cattle car. What, said Bendy. We can't live here. What if a train comes through? We'd be smashed to bits. Did you see the tracks, said Big Sister Handy Honey. They're all covered with rust, and they end just past this car. And there's weeds growing up between the ties. This is an abandoned track. Trains don't come here anymore. A sniffle came from the telepresence spell. I always feel so sorry for the cattle car fillies, Cherry Berry said. The first book is such a sweet and sad story. I'm glad it has a happy ending. If you know how it ends, Chrysalis asked, why are you making me read this to you? Why don't you get a book you haven't read? Well, because if I haven't read it yet, how would I know if I liked it? Cherry replied. I know I like all those books. I grew up with those books. They're old and dear friends to me. Chrysalis debated the merits of getting a book of matches and holding Cherry's old and dear friends hostage until the pilot gave in and chose a book that didn't give changelings diabetes. How about you take a break? Cherry asked. I'm kinda hungry, and it's about time for my breakfast. Cherry and peach dumplings with cream gravy. How many ways can you put cherries into meal packs anyway? Chrysalis asked. Dunno, Cherry said as she began rehydrating the meal pack. But these two weeks we're gonna find out how many ways heavy frosting uses. Gee. How wonderful. Chrysalis had burned out her ability to suppress her sarcasm. I can hardly wait to learn. Footnotes. 390. The Equestrian Educational Association wishes to remind the reader that the opinion held by Queen Chrysalis of such classic works as centered in tales of cheap clover, the cattle car fillies, and the collected works of Cleverly clearly is that of an evil fiend who is a stranger to pony culture and who does not appreciate heartwarming, life-affirming classic educational reading. They ask that you not judge these works by the opinion of a tyrant, and moreover a tyrant addicted to smutty, written by the dozens potboiler romance trash novels. So there, 394. 391. Mostly by imagining an enormous variety of methods for revenge she could use on Cherry Berry once she was safely back on Equus. However, she did dog-ear the page in which cheap clover skunk friend gave both barrels to the prize thieves for later rereading enjoyment, so it wasn't a total waste of her time. 392. Vinegar as an ingredient tends to enhance and amplify certain flavors in food. It's a common sauce ingredient, most notably in that universal insult to chefs everywhere, ketchup. It's also the base for romaine and vinaigrette salad dressing. The chef, heavy frosting, overused it a bit because of prior space flights demonstrating that free fall somehow numbs the taste buds, making it impossible to detect subtle flavoring. The salad dressing, in this case, was about as subtle as Pinkie Pie asking somebody's date of birth. 393. A meal of Kieran emotions gives new and medically critical meaning to the word heartburn. 
394. The author of this work wishes to remind the reader that the opinion held by the Equestrian Educational Association of Queen Chrysalis's reading habits is elitist and juvenile. This opinion is not made less elitist by the fact that it is more or less accurate. End footnotes. Fuel lines disconnect. Confirm fuel lines disconnect. Launch time T minus 60 seconds and count in, mark. Begin control test sequence. Cherry Berry leaned back in her little capsule, wearing nothing but the headset from her space suit, and listened to the voices of Equestria Space Agency through the headphones. She'd asked for the launch of ESA Flight 11 to be relayed up to her from the ground. Ever since the first time she'd seen Twilight Sparkle's prototype spaceship, she'd wanted to see it fly. Now, of course, she was almost a million kilometers away, but thanks to the wonders of modern magic, she could at least listen. Control test sequence complete, all go. Confirm all go, 11. 30 seconds to launch. Cherry envisioned the ship in her mind, based on the model she'd seen of the proposed launch stack. The big, heavy resuable orbiter stood on its butt, its three main engines held off the surface of the launch pad by the eight thumper solid fuel boosters attached to it. Clipped to its ventral surface stood a gigantic orange fuel tank, which weighed vastly more than the ship itself when full. The SRBs would burn for 100 seconds, providing enough vertical thrust for a brief suborbital space flight even if the liquid fuel engines never fired. Those engines would be just strong enough for control authority during the solid rocket burn, after they burned out, they would fire for another 7 minutes, give or take, until the giant tank was empty. After that the empty tank would be tossed away, and the orbiter would use maneuvering thrusters and a small reserve fuel supply in the ship to achieve orbit. Deorbit, and do a very little bit of steering on the way back down. A perfect mission would end with the orbiter landing on Cape Friendship's wide, well-paved runway a targeted landing of the kind Changeling space program still couldn't achieve, 395. If they were off course, though, the ship carried a dozen of the new T-35 parachutes, big and strong enough to allow a splashdown or even possibly a land touchdown if necessary. Cherry thought the whole exercise excessively ambitious, but if Twilight Sparkle and her friends pulled it off, it would be a milestone right up there with Cherry's current flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, main engine start. Cherry spun a little forward, not really able to sit up properly in free fall. Here it came. 4, 3, 2, clamps release, and liftoff. Cherry's hooves grabbed for the armrests of her flight couch as Applejack's voice continued, liftoff of Amakita's on Ekestria Space Agency Flight 11, and the clock is running. Roll program initiated, Rainbow Dash reported. Cherry imagined the tapered cigar ship and its cluster of boosters surrounding its giant fuel tank rising on a plume of smoke and flame over the shoreline of Horseshoe Bay, slowly tilting on its side and rolling over so the orbiter rested above the fuel tank. Confirm roll, Amakitas. We read you two kilometers up and three down range. Throttling back for max Q. Confirm throttle at 72%. Cherry sat, or rather floated and waited, intensely anxious. Mach 1. Cape confirms Mach 1. Go at throttle up. Amakita's copies go at throttle up. A new voice broke in, Cherry recognized Spike, Twilight's little dragon helper. ESA spaceship Amakita's is 60 seconds into its maiden flight, all systems running normally. In about 30 seconds the solid fuel boosters will burn out and separate, leaving the orbiter and its main fuel tank to continue burning for orbit. Applejack again, stand by for SRB separation. Rainbow Dash, Roger, Cape, Burnout, and Separation. Applejack again, confirm separation. Nice and clean. At 2 minutes into flight, Amakita's is 33 km high and 40 km downrange, traveling at almost 10 times the speed of sound, Spike reported. All three main engines are firing at full throttle, draining two and a half tons of fuel every second. When the burn is complete, Amakita's will be traveling about five miles every second. 
At this time the ship is beginning to nose down for orbital insertion. All systems are go, trajectory is optimal. Two engines to orbit, Applejack said. Copy two engines to orbit, Rainbow Dash said. That call only means that, if the orbiter loses one of its engines now, a longer burn on the remaining two engines will be enough to get it into orbit, Spike said quickly. All three engines are still burning and will continue to burn until Miko in approximately another five minutes. Cherry relaxed. Things could still go wrong, but the things most likely to go wrong hadn't. Amikitas hadn't had to deal with a debris cloud of smashed boosters as R4 had done. The giant fuel tank hadn't ruptured or leaked, and it didn't seem likely that it would. The couplings, the control systems, the computers were all doing their jobs. She leaned back again as Spike's voice lulled her almost to sleep, 396. She came almost awake again when she heard Applejack's voice again. One engine to orbit. Copy one engine to orbit. Estimate 30 seconds to Miko. Miko, main engine cut off. That meant Amikitas would be in orbit, or just shy of it, since the plan was for the huge fuel tank to fall back into the atmosphere and burn up. Standing by for Miko. Cherry listened carefully. She had no worries about the safety of her two Ponyville friends, not at this point. But she had something in mind, and she wanted to know the proper timing for it. Miko. Confirm Miko, Amikitas. Go for her fuel tank jettison. Fuel tank jettison. Confirm fuel tank jettison. Go for switch to internal tanks. Switching main engines to internal tanks. We read good switch over, Amikitas. 17 minutes, 40 seconds to final orbital insertion burn. 20 seconds on maneuvering thrusters only. No need, repeat, no need for main engines. Oh, yeah. Outstanding. Rainbow Dash couldn't be calm and professional forever, of course. Thanks, every pony. For the first time during the launch, Twilight Sparkle's voice echoed over the connection. We've just taken the next great step forward in space exploration. There. That was Cherry's cue. ESA 11, this is CSP 22, she said. ER, go ahead, CSP 22, Applejack said, a little cautiously. Here goes. On behalf of the ponies and other creatures of the Changeling Space Program, she said, CSP-22 offers our congratulations to the Equestrian Space Agency, and we wish Amikita's further success in the remainder of its current missions and all its missions to come. I only hope I get my own chance to ride in that ship someday. Um, thanks, Cherry I mean 22, Applejack said. Yes, thanks, Twilight said. And from Amikitas, we wish you luck tomorrow with your orbital insertion burn around Minmus. Thanks very much, Amikitas, Cherry said. Good luck, and I'll be listening to the rest of your flight. CSP-22 out. There was a brief burst of static on the magical audio signal, and then Chrysalis's voice, dripping the special kind of oral honey she reserved for the moments she was furious but couldn't show it openly, said, 22. Prepare for remedial training in comms discipline when you get home. Or Eden, I feel exactly as ashamed as I ought to, Cherry replied. In the meantime, how about my bedtime story? We're going to begin tonight with, Chrysalis's voice took on a tone of undisguised loathing. The Cattle Car Phillies and the Silo Mystery, Chapter 7 Cherry smirked as she leaned back. To tell the truth, She'd outgrown the cattle car fillies years and years before, but she still enjoyed the series and its four sweet, lovable, and courageous main characters, five if you counted the dog. And she enjoyed how the books annoyed Chrysalis even more. Footnotes 395 To be blunt, CSP had all it could do to land on the correct planet, never mind the correct land mass or body of water. 396 because of the sunset launch of CSP-22 and the sunrise launch of ESA-11, the launch was happening at the end of Cherry's mission day, and it was almost bedtime from her perspective. 
End footnotes. End of part 2.